Hello and welcome to our webinar today, Provide Trusted Data to the Business and Modernize Analytic Workloads in the Cloud. My name is Danielle Greshek. I'm a Senior Manager in Solution Architecture at AWS, and I will actually be your host and moderator for today's presentation. And today, you will learn about data and analytics at AWS, delivering a single source of truth for analytics, and enabling trusted analytics and bringing hidden insights to light. And remember, please post your questions in the chat box throughout this presentation as we will review them at the end of today's event. In addition to AWS today, we will also hear from Vincent Lam, who is the head of cloud product marketing at Talent. And we'll also hear from Andy McPhee, who is the data and analytics engineering director at AstraZeneca. So let's first talk about AWS. So when we've talked to our customers and partners, um, we've talked to them about how data is more valuable to them than ever before. And organizations that mine this data end up creating a lot more business value than those that do not. That being said, there are more ways to analyze data than ever before, and a lot more data than people think. We like to talk about the three Vs of data, velocity, volume, and variety. And there are a lot more people who are actually working with data than ever before. And so our customers ask questions about how can they provide democratized data access to all of the, the stakeholders in their organization who want to have access to this data, and yet make sure that this data is governed and not mismanaged. Traditional data warehouses are challenged to keep up with these trends and some emerging use cases. A lot of data it ends up being out of reach and the, the traditional data warehouses end up being slow and expensive. And then there's a lot of new ways to analyze data with analytical engines such as Elasticsearch, Presto, and Spark, and Hadoop. And most traditional warehouses struggle to handle the variety of data and are challenged to work with these open data formats such as Parquet and JSON. And again, traditional data warehouses are challenged to handle the growing analyst population. They struggle to have governance and control over this data over time. And again, your choice of data warehouse will affect a lot more than just your data warehouse workloads. So there's the traditional first silo where we have reporting workloads that really need that analytical horsepower of the data warehouse. And most of the time that data will be in your structure will be structured data that lives in your data warehouse. However, we need to do machine learning on the, this data, and those types of workloads will require a great deal of big data processing. And a lot of that data is going to live in your data lake, and it will be unstructured. And then finally, there's other silos in which we want to do real-time analytics or maybe some ad hoc data querying. And we need to do this interactively. And this is gonna use data from both your structured data warehouse and also some unstructured data from your data lake. And the way things are set up today, it can provide a broken view of both your business and your customers. So Amazon Redshift is the most popular and fastest growing cloud data warehouse. And customers collectively process more than two exabytes of data per day with Redshift. And you can see some of the um, variety of customers that are using Amazon Redshift today, more than 10,000 of them. And they vary from large enterprises such as McDonald's and Pfizer to small startups such as Lyft and uh, Pinterest. So Amazon Redshift will reduce time to insights and give you the performance that you will need as your business is growing. Redshift is up to two times faster than the number two cloud data warehouse. And one of the real great stories here is how the improvement of speed over in the last two years, more than 200 features and enhancements have actually been delivered. Um, and these are based on lessons from processing the massive amount of data each day with our customers. Amazon Redshift is also incredibly cost effective. You can run a 24 seven data warehouse um, and save up to 25% over other cloud data warehouses and also save money as you scale and grow your data warehouse. Through reserved instances, you can save up to 75%. This can provide you a return on investment of over 469%.
Finally, Amazon Redshift integrates with your data lake. So your Redshift data warehouse and S3 data lake will actually enable all of your workloads, removing silos and allowing you to analyze both relational and non-relational data. So let's talk a about a couple of use cases that we feel are very effective it running in AWS. So there's first the traditional business intelligence. Um, obviously, you would start with aggregating all of your data into S3 from your corporate data and applications, as well as sensors and log data. You can use Amazon AWS Glue to set up your metadata catalog. And then finally, load that data into Redshift and query that data across both your data warehouse and your data lake and then you can get visualizations through Amazon QuickSight. You can also do predictive analytics through AWS starting uh, with AWS S, uh, sorry Amazon S3 as your data lake and doing some transformations and MapReduce using Amazon EMR and then loading that data into Redshift. And then finally, you can take that data and store data sets that are ready to be trained and run machine learning models on through Amazon SageMaker. And then finally, get predictions that you need in order to make intelligent business decisions. Another use case is to do real-time streaming analytics. So you can start with input from web websites um, that sends clickstream data through Kinesis Data Firehose, and then do real-time data analytics using Kinesis Data Analytics. And then finally, reload that data into Amazon Redshift, and then run analytics models that come up with content recommendations. And then this will allow your customers to be more have more personalized content and engage more. New use cases are emerging for the modern data warehouse through, through these new tools. Financial services industries are able to analyze trade and market data and do fraud detection real time. And co companies such as NASDAQ are doing that today. Companies like Pfizer are actually analyzing clinical records to improve patient outcomes and predict disease and preventative programs. Advertising companies like Group M are analyzing clickstream data real time and doing ad impressions to improve ad targeting. Companies like Warner Brother are doing in-game and player an analysis to detect in-game behavior. And then finally, companies like Hilton are providing personalized experiences to their customers in travel and hospitality. And now I would like to introduce Vincent Lamb, who is the head of cloud product marketing at Talend. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure being here, and thank you so much for joining our joint webinar today. So today we're talking. We're going to talk a little more about this process of taking advantage of um, data warehouses in AWS, and really um, taking a holistic view of that process from start to finish. So one of the big challenges organizations face today when they're starting to build up these cloud data warehouses. Um, you know, if you're starting on, on, on Redshift and you're wondering to yourself, well, you know, how am I going to get my data in there? Or how am I going to make sure that it's right? Um, these are common problems that organizations across all industries think about. And it, it's true. I mean, you really do want to make sure that you can start your Redshift project quickly and easily. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to expose yourself at the expense of speed for trust in the data, making sure that the data is correct. And this challenge is kind of interesting because today, if you take a look at some of the way the market has evolved, um, oftentimes companies will kind of come to a decision point and they'll say to themselves, well, you know, I really want that speed, um, but uh, you know, I have some options here. Maybe I can hand code, right? I've got some savvy developers. Maybe I can purchase some point tools, right? That can help get the job done. And the problem with that is obviously um, hand coding is never cheap, <laughs> but it's also unscalable and it's ungoverned. You end up with a patchwork of solutions to try and solve this problem. And, and there are better ways. And the other aspect is if you're starting from a predominantly an on-prem um, environment, for instance, then you're thinking about maybe some legacy enterprise tools that uh, you're familiar with or, or that you've heard about. And the problem again is um, when we take a look at this agile environment in the cloud that we're talking about, 
you know, um, one of the great benefits of, of being in AWS is the fact that you can start quickly and iterate quickly and do lots of things. Um, and you don't want that legacy enterprise tool to be uh, something that slows you down, right? You don't want it to be restrictive. And so what we really want is this ultimate penultimate scenario where we can leverage all that speed and make sure we're not sacrificing trust. And so it turns out that Gartner has thought about this as well. Um, and I love this quote that they have. Through 2020, integration will take 50% of the time and cost of building a digital platform. 50% of your project's time potentially could just be putting this all together. It's not even the results. It's not even the applications that are consuming it. It is just getting this to all work together. And this is a big problem. And it turns out, of course, it's a big enough problem that we really think that, you know, if we can do this right and we can scale this right, um, the dividends are tremendous. And so when we take a look at this holistically, that really is what Talon's mission is. Uh, we want to make it simple and easy and take the complexity out of getting all that useful data um, into Redshift and pulling it out. And along the way, we're really talking about four key steps. It's about collecting the data, uh, making it useful, governing the data so that the data is trusted and you've got the right stakeholders involved in every step of the way, transforming the data to something that's useful and consumable. It could be a, a, for a variety of um, end uses, uh, including machine learning or analytics, and sharing it across the environment, right? So making sure that once you've gone through all that arduous process of putting it all together, that it can be used by anyone and, any, and um, everywhere. And so one of the, the really important facts of this is that along the way, if you do this right, you really don't want to be encumbered, right? So you want to take advantage of the fact that if you happen to have an on-prem environment and you want to pull data out of it, that you can, right? Uh, or that if you're kind of starting and you have your, your foot in, 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 or toes rather in, in both ponds, uh, that you can maybe uh, transition to a hybrid environment first, right? So there are a lot of scenarios that you can really try uh, if you can square this away. And along the way, I'd like to also point out just the different personas that are involved. I think a lot of times, you know, we have a very technical audience, right? A lot of AWS users are very technical and that's terrific. But when we're talking about data and the contents of data, um, you know, IT is just one part of that conversation. And the other half, really, we have to talk about the people that use the data, that consume the data, most typically on the business side, and making sure that they're empowered every step of the way to be able to um, leverage this data and also uh, remediate the data as it goes through. So together with AWS, Talent has 1,500 plus joint customers. Um, you know, and you can see a lot of the logos there, every, everyone from AstraZeneca, who you'll hear from later today, um, to other companies like UPenn or DRG or Johnson Controls or Bayer. And so um, this is something that is completely repeatable and really is a recipe for success when it comes to leveraging a data warehouse. So why talent for AWS? What, what exactly is the special sauce that we're talking about here? So uh, earlier I talked about the process, right? And all those different steps that it takes, but let's, let's get a little practical here. Let's say you have a project in AWS and you're leveraging Amazon QuickSight, or maybe you're using SageMaker for some machine learning. And so you know you wanna use that data, you wanna, you wanna get these results, you wanna be able to do this analytics. Um, but the problem is when you're kind of working backwards from the, from the solution, you say to yourself, well, gosh, you know, not all our data is you know, in Redshift or S3 right now, and it's coming from a variety of different sources. We have no idea where. Um, you know, we start a tally and, and you know, the list just gets longer and longer and longer. Uh, and it's not even consistent. It's not like you're saying that your data is all in structured databases, right? And you go, okay, well, I can just move a couple of tables here. But really, um, your data can be anywhere, right? I mean, it could be in your marketing and analytics apps, your SaaS apps, right? It could be um, in your enterprise apps that are on-prem or in the cloud. It could be in your big data environment that's on-prem, right? And it, it's a really big, healthy mix. And so what you want to be able to do is say to yourself, well, I know what the result is, and I know what I need to do. It's the how, and that's the part where we come in. We want to simplify the how as much as possible so that if you have any source you're thinking about, you don't have to worry about the how. You go, you know what? The data is there. Perfect. We're going to grab it. Or the application is there. Perfect. We're going to grab it. And then along the way, it's not just about grabbing the data, right? That's just one aspect of it. It's everything else we talked about before. 
that's part of the speed element, but you, you've got to build in that trust. And you can see that big governance arrow on the bottom, right? And that and what that means is every step of the way, as it goes through the AWS ecosystem, you might be going from like an S3 uh, processing an EMR and then going to Redshift. You want to make sure that the data is consistent, it's clean, it's trustworthy. It's something you can take advantage of. And so that process there is really important. I don't want to trivialize it. But if you can do that in a way that's scalable, in a way that's methodical, then you're going to get that speed and trust that you're really looking for. And the end results will benefit as well. Your models in SageMaker will be that much better. Um, you're in QuickSight, you're going to get some real insight into your data that you probably couldn't before if it was um, all muddled. And, and of course, if there was potentially bad data in there. So we're built for AWS. Talon uh, Cloud has over 70 plus um, components for AWS. So if you're a, uh, you know, a, a fluent AWS user, then you're probably familiar with every single one of these icons here. We couldn't list all 70, but you know, services like S3, RDS, Aurora, DynamoDB, Redshift, Kinesis, EMR, all natively supported within Talon Cloud. And what that really means for you is that you know, Talon Cloud is built to take advantage of all the, the benefits of AWS. It's meant to take advantage of the ecosystem within AWS, and it works natively with AWS. And so that means whatever your use case, whatever you're thinking about, um, all those things are achievable with the scale and with the repeatability and with the resources that you're familiar with in AWS. And it couples very well. It's a unified environment for all of that. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the key capabilities. Uh, you know, when you're using Talon on AWS, you get a lot of benefits, right? Um, and so how do you kind of get to that point where you have this fully governed data lake and modern data warehouse? Uh, well, first, it's about being able to start quickly. And we have a variety of different ways built uh, for different personas. We have tools that are built for hardcore ETL developers, and we have tools that are really simple that, you know, anybody, even an entry-level analyst who says, you know, gosh, I wish I could get to my Salesforce data and uh, in, in Redshift, you know, they can do that in two clicks. And that's something that we make available across our platform. It's one single platform. And so you can ingest data from the cloud and on-premise sources to AWS in minutes, really simple, really fast. And then it's about being able to scale, right? I mean, one of the great benefits of AWS is that it is so scalable. And of course, fortunately, Talent Cloud is built to scale with it, right? So we generate native code for all these jobs so that they can run natively on Amazon EMR and scale up and scale down as required. And in fact, we're very cost conscious too. So as your workloads on AWS change, we can turn on and off services to help you. Um, on top of that, it's about really being able to cleanse and share data across AWS and hybrid environments, right? We realize that, you know, we live in a messy world and there are lots of bits and pieces and it's sometimes you can do a project and it's very, very clean. It's all in one location. And other times, you know, you, you, you have a history to deal with or you have partners to deal with or you have limitations to deal with. And uh, we really make it simple to be able to work in those hybrid environments as well. So we talked a little bit before about all the components in, in a modern data warehouse with AWS. And this is a more um, kind of a very typical example. And, and I think this uh, highlights some of the, the way the bits and pieces within the Amazon ecosystem work with talent. Right. So um, let's kind of go from left to right here. Um, if you take a look at the left, we've talked about that a, a little bit already before. But again, just think about where the data you want is. and get it, right? So it could be IoT, it could be social media, web logs, enterprise apps, it doesn't matter. Uh, Talent makes it trivial to get to that data. Okay, so then you've got that data, where are you going to put it? Well, you can put it actually in a couple of locations, right? If it's, uh, you know, large batches or periodic, um, you can put it in S3, which is terrific. If it's real-time or streaming, let's say an IoT sensor data, you can stream it to Kinesis, right? And these are pretty typical use cases. Now, along the way, remember, I talked about that governance that I pointed out earlier. And I, I want you to just kind of imagine everything in that box that you see on the screen here is governed. And what that means is we don't just blanket throw things in there and hope for the best. What we do is we intentionally move data. And as we're moving the data, we're going to make sure it's right. We're going to make sure it's clean. We're going to make sure that it's standardized, right? So that, you know, if, uh, you know, gender is represented with numbers in one table and words with another and initials in another, that somehow that becomes streamlined so it makes sense to the business analyst on the right who's going to consume the data. And so what often happens is uh, the streaming data, it usually gets uh, pooled into an S3 bucket, right? And so you've got really your amalgamation of all your data there. Sometimes it goes straight to EMR, but ultimately it does get to EMR both directions. And what happens there is uh, with talent, we create 
native code that run, runs on EMR. And what that means is sometimes you're going to do a lot of data processing, right? And lightweight stuff is trivial, but sometimes you might go a little heavier. And you want to make sure that you have the processing oomph to uh, get from left to right very, very quickly. Remember, speed and trust are really important to success. And so we take advantage of EMR to do that. And then finally, when the data is all cleansed, it's clean, it's governed, it's exactly the way you need it, it's extremely consumable and trustworthy, we can put it into Redshift. And now that data in Redshift that's being consumed by all those other uh, subsequent services and users is really, really trivial and easy to use, right? There are no questions, no head scratching about what is this, what am I looking at? It's very obvious that, you know, this is your sales data and here are exactly all the trustworthy, um, you know, accounts and values that you were depending on to build your reports. So uh, just a quick recap and fast facts about Talon and AWS. Uh, we are, of course, a partner with AWS. We're an advanced technology partner with a focus on the data and analytics competency. Uh, together, Talon and AWS together have over 1,500 customers. And we have, again, over 70 dedicated built for AWS integration components. Uh, you can find us on the marketplace. We have a, a pretty quick and easy tool called a Stitch Data Loader, which is a great way to uh, get started if you just want to load the data warehouse really quickly. Uh, go on Marketplace and check it out. It's uh, really simple to use. We have, um, within our larger platform of Talon Cloud, we have our remote engines, which are bring your own license that you can use on Marketplace. And of course, if you're really looking for the whole enchilada with Talon, I highly recommend you take a look at Talon Cloud itself. Uh, you can find uh, information about that on our website, talon.com. And uh, you know, as a cloud solution, obviously we couple very well with the way that you think and work with. If you're familiar with using cloud services and leveraging AWS, then you know all the benefits of the cloud already. And needless to say, Talon Cloud is built with that in mind. Uh, on top of that, um, just a plug to you know other things that we can do if you want to, right? Uh, API services are available that you can create, consume. Uh, and we also have a, a new entry level tool called Pipeline Designer, which is a pretty cool next generation tool for data integration in the cloud. So with that, um, I'm actually going to turn it over now to Andy McPhee um, with AstraZeneca. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Andy McPhee. I'm the Data Engineering Director at AstraZeneca. We are a global science-led biopharmaceutical business, and I look after data engineering covering our early science, R&D, uh, imaging, genomics, chemistry, uh, data streams, through to late science, which covers our clinical trials, uh, patient safety and regulatory, into uh, enabling units, our finance, HR, compliance departments. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of challenges we faced uh, and into the, uh, the the transformation that we have undertaken using AWS and Talent, and finally talk to some of the, uh, the the future work that we will be doing again using AWS and Talent. But first of all, about AstraZeneca. So we are a uh, innovative medicines organisation uh, that are you the innovative innovative medicines used by millions of patients. So we cover most of the globe, over 120 countries, uh, with 60,000 employees across all those locations. And one of the things I'm very proud about with AstraZeneca is we are one of the few companies that actually think about the value chain of a drug from actually its discovery all the way through it getting into the hands of the patient. We cover that entire life cycle, right from that R&D um, to actually turning that R&D into a, a commercial product. Okay, so I was talking about some of the market forces that we we had in our 2013 uh, around essentially the organization i'm in we the drugs that we discover will go through a patent uh, period and if we don't find get finally get that drug to commercialization in time then we will lose the patent and therefore the drug exclusivity and actually we found a lot of our drugs face this market uh, crisis in 2013 what that did mean is we had to change the way we looked at our data, the way that we looked at our um, the organization. So we changed from a, a wide reaching pharmaceutical organization to focus on just uh, several therapeutic areas. So really trying to slim that down and change in the way that we looked at our products and portfolio strategy. And the main challenges we faced. So in, ter in terms of the systems we had, um, we, we weren't on cloud in, in any way, shape or form. We had inflexible uh, systems. Um, and also it meant that what we provisioned in terms of our, our, our capability wasn't scalable. Especially when we looked at our finance departments, 
a lot of the data was siloed. Uh, we had data in lots of different regions, lots of different environments. And that meant that we weren't necessarily getting a, a consistent version of the truth when it came to uh, being able to tell the markets exactly what we were doing in, in terms of our, our commercial uh, results. Uh, we didn't have data governance uh, in the sense of looking at our data from a lens of master data and also being able to steward that data effectively. That didn't exist in the organization. We also had uh, incumbent organizations that were responsible for a lot of our infrastructure that acted as single points of failure. Uh, and I talked a little bit about the fact that we needed to uh, over, you know, over provision our systems for performance simply because we didn't have any scalable um, infrastructure in place. It also meant that the business felt that they needed to do it themselves, having lost trust in the data. So there was quite a lot of shadow IT in various forms across the globe in terms of our finance departments, with each finance department per market almost creating their own IT department. So briefly going through where we come from, the architecture that we had essentially was very fragmented across different parts of our organization. We were dealing with in some examples here where our finance data was either in Europe or it was in, U in the US. We were actually dealing with eight separate global SAP systems worth of data, all configured slightly differently due to organic growth and changes in those markets. And then what this actually meant was we were dealing with systems that were uh, creaking, that they had uh, lots of problems in terms of multiple data models so we couldn't even talk the same language in terms of our data it also meant that we were seeing people having to manually uh, intervene with data uh, essentially providing the, the flow you know breaking it from an automated fashion more into having manual overrides to get the data right so that we could get that to the various management levels and governance levels uh, across the organization this led us to a transformation and actually we were very lucky that our um, leadership identified that we needed to transform in this space and it knew that we needed to do it first of all uh, to provide confidence to the market confidence to our shareholders uh, that we could actually start to gain some agility in how we delivered so first of all it was around being able to tell that story faster uh, and this meant that we needed to accelerate time to market in terms of those results in terms of the data that we had and bearing in mind that our finance function was dealing with data from our, our whole commercial environment across those 120 markets, but also dealing with how we uh, looked at the costs across our manufacturing. And, and then finally, our, our R&D itself, how we dealt with our three, at the time, three main science units. The actual areas that we started to focus was around uh, our financial reporting systems. So financial reporting and also financial planning to make sure that we were actually looking five to seven years ahead. And then the other piece around data governance, as I mentioned before, this was something that we had very little, if none of. And so actually investing in that as a capability within the organization. This allowed us to actually think about lowering our costs, but actually more importantly, massively simplifying our systems. So rather than having duplications across every single environment we had in every single finance region, we were actually able to try and centralize that. So this is an example of one of the, the situations that we faced on a monthly basis uh, within AstraZeneca, especially around our financial data. Um, as with most organizations, financial data volume fluctuates throughout the month. Um, and actually what we find is peaks coming through yeah, at the end of the month and especially the workload that we needed to to produce our new data structures but also how we could take that data and use it for reporting and planning we found that we were having peaks and fluctuations and this led back to that point i made around over provisioning infrastructure we really needed to move away from that over provisioning of infrastructure and that's where we, re we really started to look at aws as a means to scale essentially our, our infrastructure when we needed it for the right reason. That actually meant we could start to think about, again, not necessarily massively changing our source systems, uh, but then how do we bring it together into a, a common information model? Uh, again, describing the whole business on one in one language, integrating that with our master data. So being able to talk about cost centers and the way that we're 
looking at our financial data through a single chart of accounts and mastering that information and feeding that into the common information model, mainly so we can start to see where we have got trust in our data. You know, have we got huge quality issues with data coming into that common information model that we know we need to go back to the markets to fix? Because the most important thing here is getting it right at source, not necessarily fixing it along the way as we had been doing. We also started to integrate it with other sources that hadn't generally been used in this workflow before. So bringing HR data so we could start to get workforce management and, and really start to understand the organization better. And this allowed us to feed that into a common contextual way of looking at the data. Again, bringing our measures and metrics into a single place that fed not only our business intelligence systems, but also our financial planning systems. So here's where we started to think conceptually around what we were going to be doing with our data as we move it through uh, that new architecture. We weren't really changing, as I said, we weren't, from my perspective, data engineering didn't really start at that capture stage. And so this is a really a diagram that describes my framework for the seven C's of data, where we're not really changing data at capture, but it's actually then how we bring it through uh, a, a method of collecting, using S3 to get it into a single data lake where we can look at all of our data in one place. And we use Talon heavily to bring that data into that data lake, mainly because we can containerize our Talon code, we can configure it through scripts as opposed to hard coding and, and actually bring the data in really fast from those data sources. But data in the data lake is nothing if you aren't, if you don't understand it, if you can't find it. So that's where we really start to think about curation. And again, here we can use the governance tool sets from Talon to sit on top of our data and start to understand it more. So Talon Data Catalog will provide us with that rich metadata layer that we can start to use on, on top of S3 and also by interrogating the actual data sources themselves to make sure that we've actually got the right data in that data lake for the future use cases. I mentioned before we had multiple sources of data from uh, different systems and often you know we're talking about SAP data it's it's virtually the same except it's been configured differently across each of those systems so we had to conform that we had to make it look consistent across all the different environments um, and and we did that we started doing that for finance but then we started to look at it from our clinical data at our um, safety data commercial data to really try to get that single source of truth that conform layer bringing that into the contextual data structures that we needed uh, again so where we would conform and essentially really try and get the data into a relational format and store that in aurora but actually it was the real power that we got when we started to pull that into redshift that as part of our contextual layer really started to build out data marts that fed either our, our standard financial management reporting but it was the same data marts that would then feed our financial planning systems so we're starting to get consistency around what we say we're going to do and also what we've done and that's really at that contextual layer around the marts cubes and big data clusters now where we would then say how we you know connect that data so here's where we're starting to use api technology on top of our, our redshift clusters and this allows us to actually start to apply this data to other analytical applications and also more importantly where we can start to make it available for data scientists to start to use in some of the work that they they're doing and i'll talk a bit more about in the next slide and the final piece is that that consume so for our finance teams we've been using um, oracle business intelligence as our bi tool and it's really plugged straight into that uh, redshift layer but also plugs straight into the the planning tool sets that we've used to so really get that single uh, view of all of the data so on from the seven C's of data, I'll talk a little bit about the data science use cases. And again, so this, this really allowed us to start to use the same information that we collected in that data lake. We'd started to understand it, curate that information, but actually really what we wanted to do was very quickly get that into some contextual uh, format so that data scientists can very quickly prepare data. They can actually load that very quickly into a data mart of their own, again, using Redshift. And they do that using an EMR cluster. So we would use EMR heavily to transform that information as needed from our data lake into a data scientist, uh, essentially preparation area, again, using S3 to store some of that, that pre-processed and then processed data. 
but this really allowed them to speed up the time they got that data so they could spend more time writing their algorithms uh, and, and essentially looking at use cases like competitive forecasting. How could we improve the way that markets are, are looking at their, their models in terms of competitive forecasting with this finance data? Again, using Redshift allowed us to store this data consistently. So we were able to move the data between uh, different use cases and use data we might have used for a, 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 a travel and expenses use case uh, to a spending uh, use case and then moving that into say something like I said the competitive forecasting use case. So uh, apologies for the busy slide but again what I wanted to try and get across here is that we're moving more and more to a modular architecture and actually it's the cloud that's allowing us to do this and it's allowing to do this again using uh, technology that we're starting to make use of like uh, Fargate and ECS so we can build out our talent stack in a, in a really repeatable way. We can then apply that stack across a multiple uh, AWS accounts so we can actually start to create a multi account, account environment really so that we get the best out of the security of the system but also so you know in the security from that perspective so that we're reducing things like the blast radius should anything happen but it also means that we can start to think about how you can move workload and how you can move data between different use cases using this modular architecture. And then also start to think about how do I, how do I provide the environment to a data scientist who will need to do something on a data science platform, but it's all fed from the same place. It's all fed from our single data lake of information. Again, all the metadata stores allow you to search, find that information through a data catalog and embedding our data management, our reference data management um, and data quality processes into the way that we collect and conform and then add contextualized uh, information to that data is really key. And we've talked about some of the, uh, the AWS tool sets we're using. Um, S3 is at the heart of our data lake. Uh, Redshift and Aurora are really at the heart of our conform and contextual layers. Um, and really we're starting to use you know, Redshift more and more uh, on top of the data science and graph technologies that we're starting to use that will really underpin a lot of the data scientists work. So going back to finance, so what was the effect? Um, so before what we found was, and with any financial reporting uh, system, we're, we're reliant on month end, a lot of things closing, a lot of things being available, and often that can take a number of days. So part of this was process change. It's not just all done through technology. We had to look at people and process as well. But what it did mean that with the combination of those people, process, and new technology working together, we were able to bring in our month end twice as fast. And in doing so, we were also able to, because we simplified our infrastructure and we were able to do more with the same amount of people that we had, it meant a 50% saving in our operating cost for the systems we were using for financial planning and reporting. And this has actually led us to where, where we are today. So over the last 18 months, the financial transformation uh, project um, has actually led to a full business transformation of our finance teams and turned that into a global business services operation. It has also meant that we're now applying exactly the same patterns to what we're doing for our clinical development. This is late science. This is thinking about how we move a drug through its testing phase to get it ready for commercialization. And actually what we're able to do is accelerate um, what we're doing in terms of clinical trials. Our aim is to accelerate that from sometimes up to 15 years down to a couple of years to really try and maximize the, the value of the, the product, but also getting it to patients faster, making a real difference. And actually looking back, what we've got now is a, a, a fully AWS connected system. We're deploying infrastructure as code using uh, cloud formation scripts. This allows us to actually have that deep connectivity to AWS, but also means that we can provide uh, regulatory scrutiny that comes with all of our drug development, uh, that we're not actually you know, modifying code uh, where we shouldn't be. Everything is locked down as uh, infrastructure and software as code. We've actually got, as I say, many systems in our in our cloud-based data integration. Now we're starting to roll this out across our late science and early science functions. The scalability is key. We're no longer having to over-provision our infrastructure, uh, which actually means from our, our sysops cloud engineering teams, 
they can provide to our finance teams a huge degree of predictability when it comes to cost and it's not a shock when we know you know at the end of the month we, we see what the bill looks like so a little bit around how we're working with talent um and i'm conscious of time because i lost a bit earlier on so the the, the talent uh partnership astrazeneca has uh, has been going on since before i joined astrazeneca three and a half years ago but it's really expanded huge amounts and we're probably about five times as big as we were when i started in terms of our talent use uh, we're, we're probably sitting more, you know, 70, looking at over 100 concurrent developers coming over into 2020. Uh, again, talent projects keeps in, increasing. And, and actually, the way that we've deployed that across our environments, I talked about this multi-account uh, architecture that we're using, means that actually, because we're using talent, we're using infrastructure as code, it's very easy to implement those stacks in a very consistent way across those environments. Again, what we've got in terms of the, the partnership with talent is, if you think about the way that we need to work with, with talent, we're able to partner with talent to actually understand where they're going in terms of their strategic roadmap. We're actually starting to make heavy use of their, their cloud fabric and how we can start to implement talent uh, using you know, talent on their cloud, on, on, on that as a service, as opposed to having to have it within our, in our own cloud at AstraZeneca. We actually use a, a solution architect service from Talent as well, which allows us to get rapid response to our, our uh, problems if we have them. Um, and again, how we've been able to partner through Talent is them working with us to, to essentially provide us with skilled resources, the partners they have that they know use Talent well, that can help me in my data engineering function scale. And we use a company called Vichusa heavily for that. So the final uh, slide really is around this path forward. So I've talked a lot about how we're going to transform uh, other functions, other units, other, other business units. We've, we've started with finance. We really started to leverage that for our clinical trials area, but actually now we're looking at the early science piece. So how we can start to use AWS talent to move that data into a trusted source with all the related metadata uh, for things like imaging, how can we start to transform our genomics and multi-omics platforms? Uh, what does it mean to our chemistry practices? So how we're bringing data for augmented drug design. So all of these start to come together to form a, 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 a set of platforms that we now use AstraZeneca to manage our data. So, and that's really where I was gonna finish and handing back to Danielle for Q&A for the last 10 minutes. Yes, great, great. Thank you, Andy, so much. Um, so a couple of questions that we have in the questions panel, and please, if you have any questions, definitely post them in there. Um, so Andy, first and foremost, um, you know, when, when you had your slide uh, up that showed the seven Cs, what infrastructure component was being used for your operational data store in that diagram? Can you speak to that? Yes, yeah, sure. So we essentially brought Aurora in for that. Um, we started off using Aurora mainly because we knew we were going to be dealing with a relational data store. And this is an ODS, so it is an operational data store. This isn't a warehouse. Really what we're trying to do, finance's need was to see the very latest state of their data. Uh, but again, bringing that through from all those multi-sources into a common information model meant that we could quickly deploy that common information model into an Aurora instance. Okay, great. Um, so also, uh, you know, you had talked a little bit about sort of the next plans for 2020 as far as, you know, your future projects. Is that going to be mostly focused on, on genomics and new clinical science projects? Yes, yeah, so I think both uh, early and late science is our focus going forward. Uh, the, the finance... Okay program I talked about actually is, is live where we fully in build and run mode for that platform now um, clinical we've done a year's worth of, of delivery already but we're still building out that single source of truth and it's early science for this year has really been in a planning phase ready to kick off using our existing patterns to apply the same so uh, again I've talked about imaging how we bring our image data with associated metadata have talked about our omics data really trying to get to you know a number of millions in terms of sequenced genomes 
And then in terms of our, our augmented drug design, there's a, a huge raft of instrument data being used from a, a lab perspective. So very, very different and diverse set of data. Okay, great, thank you. So Andy, sorry, more questions for you. I think um, the clinical data use case has a lot of relevance for folks. And so one of the questions here is, you know, with your architecture, can you talk a little bit more about how you address governance by specifically enforcing data security, either through policy, you know, do you do use policy compliance, masking, pseudo anonymization um, for all of your classification levels? Can you just talk, add some context to how you handle data governance? Yep, of course. So all of our data is stored in S3 in a secure area in our data lake. Now, when we're moving that information through into a conformed layer, we run through a series of um, questionnaires with our privacy office to make sure that we're not doing anything with that data that could uh, essentially expose uh, a lot of the data could be patient data. So it's very, it's very uh, sensitive information. Uh, most of the data we will leave in our data lake. We won't take that forward from an analytics perspective. We don't need to go into the, the detail of that patient information. However, we do also uh, mask it on, on, on transfer. Again, we use talent to mask our data as we move it downstream into that conformed layer uh, and also into its contextual layer. And the other thing around security and privacy and regulation that governs, especially around GXP, all our platforms are GXP qualified. So essentially what that means is the infrastructure as code, both from spinning up all of our AW infrastructure, then the talent code we write and deploy uh, is essentially completely locked down and therefore can't be touched in production, which means that we are in a, uh, a fully regulatory GXP qualified environment. Okay, great. Um, so probably last question that we're going to have time for. So, um, Andy, you had mentioned that you're going to, you're planning to move to Talent Cloud rather than continuing to use the IaaS offering. Um, what's driving that decision? So part of that decision is really around being able to deploy into our essentially much more componentized and containerized type uh, use cases. So a good example here is being able to provide services. That means that, is that we can use the talent cloud to essentially send and, and run a lot of our compute. Uh, but then what that means is we can also start to think about how can we start to develop talent code that we can containerize uh, and push more to, to essentially a lot of the other instruments that we're running. So we really start to think about the edge use case. Uh, for, for running our data and, and data integration. So rather than going and getting data from places, we're actually getting everything to push it towards our, our lake. And actually what I would rather do is rather than having to maintain a lot of that on our cloud, actually start to make use of Talent Cloud where I don't have to keep upgrading myself and go through that painful process that means I have to upgrade the environment uh, all the time. And what I can do is I can make use of Talent Services and again, still still use my my own S3 buckets, still use the data where I need it to be, but actually use the cloud infrastructure that Talon provide. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you to Andy and Vincent, and thank you all for attending today's webinar. So please remember to stay connected and complete the brief survey at the conclusion, and we look forward to supporting you in your current and future projects. And thank you again, and have a great day.